Hi everyone, and welcome to the CBP Nonprofit Research Video Review. Again, I'm Dr. Deed Harrison. I am president of Chiropractic Biophysics Technique and Seminars, and also president of Chiropractic Biophysics Nonprofit, our research organization. We're going to go through our 31st CBP Nonprofit Research publication this week. Uh, this one is a little bit of a, a headbanger. It's a little technical. I'm going to skip through some of the uh, you know, engineering equations. I'll just refer to them, tell you what they mean. And if you're really interested, you can read through this one on your own. However, by nature, this is a very technical project. I'll try to soften it quite a bit so we don't lose interest and uh, focus in this very important topic. Uh, this week, we're going to go through our paper, Compar Comparison of Axial, meaning compression and tension, and flex flexural, meaning bending forward, bending backwards, like bending moments, stresses in lordosis, and three buckled configurations of the cervical spine. Okay, now buckled configurations mean altered alignment, kyphotic configurations, S-curves, things like that. This project was led by myself, my late uh, father, Dr. Don Harrison, uh, his advisor, Dr. Taddeus Yannick, uh, Dr. Uh, William Jones, PhD, and Dr. Rene Caillé, and then uh, Dr. Martin Ormond. Uh, what we have on this project is three mechanical engineers uh, to assist us. So three mechanical engineers and two of them are mathematicians. So we have a PhD in mathematics, we have a PhD in mathematics and a master's degree in engineering, and then we have a full professor, PhD, uh, from Mississippi State, uh, Bill Jones, in mechanical engineering. Uh, the reason I need to say that is so you understand uh, the impact and the validity of the approach that we used. Okay, of course, I couldn't do this one on my own. Uh, my idea, my concept, my background, but the equations I, I needed uh, a great deal of help with. So this was Clinical Biomechanics 2001. Uh, it is volume 16, page 276 through 284. Now today, is a special day. Today is May 11th. Uh, you will not see this video today. However, uh, my late father would have been 70 years old today. So I'm here to acknowledge him and I'm going through this particular project because this is one of the impactful things that he did in his life. He gave us the great understanding of how spine alignment changes affect the state of degenerative change in your spine or contribute to what's called spinal arthritis and disc disease. Now many people had, had alluded to this in the past, but nobody in chiropractic had really uh, been able to you know, test this and show where spinal arthritis and disc disease came from. Quite frankly, they didn't have the background for it. They weren't engineers, they weren't mathematicians. So this was part of my father's life's work to get chiropractors to understand how certain alignments will affect and contribute to spine damage, spine arthritis and disc disease over time. So this is in honor of my late father, Dr. Don Harrison, who would have been 70 year, years old today, May 11th. Okay, first and foremost, when we look at the neck curve from the side, uh, we know that we should have a smooth, uniform, geometric shape in that neck. We've talked about this in previous studies. We call this the cervical lordosis or the cervical lordotic configuration. Here's the teeth, so the person is facing to the reading left. Now, here's the vertebral bodies, what we call the bone or body of the vertebra. Back here are the articular facets or the articular pillars. Uh, there's actually two of them and they're superimposing. I'll show you a bird's eye view coming up. Well, we know that the cervical curve should be a smooth, uniform shape, and we've modeled that with a piece of a circle. Okay? The piece of a circle approximates the pathway along the posterior vertebral body margins or the back of the vertebra. Just look at the shape of this green line if you see color. If you don't see color, it'll show up as a gray. Now, when I look at the space between the vertebral bodies, that's my disc space, and normally we should have nice, healthy disc spaces. Now, as we age, these do get smaller over time, but I want you to know degeneration is not simply an effect of age, okay? For example, here's a patient that has been injured. This patient is in their early 30s. This patient over here on the left is also in their early 30s. 
Now, if you look at this person's spine, you, you'll see two things. They have an altered alignment. Their alignment is not normal. It is not even close to an approximate or approximating a piece of a circle. Okay, so we have an altered shape in this curvature from the side of the neck. And then the second thing you'll notice, if you look right here between joints C5 and C6, why do we call them five and six if you're a patient out there? This is bone number two, this is three, this is four, this is five, this is six. Look at the space between five and six and compare that to the one above, four, five, and below. What do you notice? Well, you'll notice right away it's a thin disc. It's a damaged disc and you're starting to see changes on the vertebral body. If you look carefully, there's some changes in the way it appears. That's called the early form of spinal arthritis and disc disease. Okay, now. Let's just use some common sense and some logic before we dive into this paper. This person is in their early 30s. Let's say they're 31. How old is that disc at C5 and C6? How old is it? 31, right? If the person's 31, it's 31. Okay, so then let's look at this disc in the same person. How old is that disc? 31, right? Same age. So why is this disc damaged and this one not? It has nothing to do with how old the person is, right? Oh, you have age-related spine arthritis and disc disease, right? Well, really, why isn't it affecting the other joints? Why is it only affecting C5, C6? Is it age? They're the same age, right? So something else is going on there. I'm here to talk about what that something else is. Now, hopefully, if you're a doctor out there, you understand this. Now, if you're a patient, a light bulb should have went off. You should go, Oh, holy cow, it's not just because I'm 31 that I have disc disease, because it's not affecting every disc, right? Back to this. Now there's controversy on this in the literature with what I'm about to say. I'm gonna summarize this and give you a perspective and then we'll dive into the paper. Now number one, in some cases, spinal arthritis and disc disease, it can be considered normal. Now that seems counterintuitive, but in some cases it can be considered normal. Things wear out over time. However, we should see a relative uniform wearing of the tissues throughout the spine. If you have a certain injury, maybe you see a little bit more in one place than another, but you shouldn't see this overtly different degenerative change, and it shouldn't be moderate to severe. We're talking about mild. So keep in mind, there, there are some cases where degenerative joint disease might be considered normal. That might be counterintuitive. However, when we look at the literature, the literature is relatively clear in saying that as you get more spine arthritis and disc disease in your neck, you tend to have some problems, okay? Now it's not a strong, strong indicator of health and disease, but it is one of the variables that predicts pain, dysfunction, things like that. So let's look at a study by Peterson. Uh, Cynthia Peterson is a chiropractor, I believe also a master's degree, spine 2003. What they did is they looked at a population of people, looked at their lateral cervical, AP cervical, and then looked at whether or not they had pain and then looked at uh, statistical relationships between the variables. What they found was a statistically significant positive correlation that they described as weak and tried to downplay a little bit. However, it's still statistically significant between self-reported pain intensity and the severity of DJD. They call it weak and then it's downplayed, but the reality of it is, it's still a statistically significant finding. So the more extensive the arthritis, or what we call degenerative joint disease, DJD, AKA spine arthritis and disc disease that all call SAD, S-A-D-D, the severity of that is related to the, the, the severity of self-reported pain, okay? So here's, an x-ray of somebody that's in their mid 40s. This shows right here a disc that's damaged. So this would be considered, you know, mild to moderate degenerative change in the vertebral body in the disc. Okay, not quite mild, not quite moderate, but it's, you know, mild to moderate. Okay, uh, 1991, Journal of Rheumatology. Radiographs of 5,440 men and women between the ages of uh, 20 and 65 years of age. What they identified in this project was that disc degeneration is associated with neck pain in men, however, not in women in this particular project. So some studies 
you know, it's hit or miss. Is it male or female, right? In this particular project, it was related to pain in men, but not in women. Okay, now, as we age, though, we find out it becomes more problematic in terms of the, the SAD, the spinal arthritis and disc disease. The more you get, the more likelihood of you having more complications and more dysfunction and not just what we call pain. So this particular project was uh, 1988 in spine. What they identified here was that disc protrusion, posterior bone spurs that they call osteophytes, that means on the back of the vertebral bodies, and what we call retrolisthesis, meaning a backwards shift of a vertebra, okay, is a primary etiology to what's called cervical spondylotic myelopathy. Now, cervical spondylotic myelopathy is a condition that the degeneration, the disc and the bone, puts direct pressure on your spinal cord. It doesn't just cause pain. It actually causes weakness and atrophy, uh, b gait and balance problems. People can have alteration in the gait, due in, you know, an alteration in leg motor function due to pressure on the spinal cord in the cervical spine. You gotta realize the nerves that go to your legs, they run all the way through your spinal column originating in the brain going through the neck. So when you have degenerative change in the cervical spine, as it gets more severe, you start to get more pronounced effects and you start to get effects that are distal or lower than the region of the de degeneration. Okay, so seniors out there, when you have balance disorders, gait disorders, that means walking disorders, you may very well have pretty extensive damage to your cervical spine, okay? Maybe you didn't have neck pain or, or maybe you only had mild neck pain, but now it's progressed and it's gotten to where it's really affecting the spinal cord. I'll get back to that. Here's a 10-year longitudinal study by Gore and Spine in 2001. Now, I'm only gonna touch on the key finding in the Gore paper. There's some controversy in this particular paper that I personally wrote a letter to the editor with. You can look that up. You can look at uh, Dr. Gore's response to that if you're interested. What I wanna point out is the primary finding in this particular paper. It's a longitudinal study, a minimum of 10 year follow-up on these subjects. Originally, the data was published in 1986, and what was found when at long-term follow-up, the people that were asymptomatic, well actually all the people were asymptomatic initially, however, the ones that developed symptoms at this minimum of 10 year follow-up, there was one feature that was a statistically significant predictor of who was experiencing pain at 10 year follow-up when they were initially asymptomatic. Here's what they identified. The presence of degenerative changes at the C5 through C7 levels on the initial X-ray was a statistically significant predictor of pain at minimum of 10 year follow-up. 15% of their population developed symptoms at 10 year follow-up, okay? They, uh, participants initially were 200 subjects. At 10 year follow-up, 159 of them uh, you know, came back in. So roughly an 80% rate of long-term follow-up. This is important because, hey, when you look at somebody cross-sectionally, one point in time, you go, oh, well, that finding isn't related to pain. But you follow them for 10 years and you start to see that, yes, this actually is a contributor to pain. It's like you look at somebody that has cancer. Maybe they don't have pain today, right? So then cancer's normal for you, right? Because it doesn't cause pain. Well, no, that's not it. You follow this person later, what does that cancer do? You may get pain and a lot of it, and not just that, your body starts to break down and you die, right? So it, it's, it, you gotta put this in perspective. Just because a variable does not predict or correlate another variable at one point in time does not mean it's not valuable or important to that person's health and disease process. Okay, put it in perspective. Here's a study by uh, Mark Iori, uh, Spine 1997. Mark Iori and Henderson, uh, both uh, chiropractors with PhDs. Uh, Professor Mark Iori is actually uh, chancellor of uh, one of the largest chiropractic colleges in the world. That's uh, Palmer in uh, Davenport, Iowa. Uh, what they did is they looked at 700 consecutive patients and they looked at 
the, the number of levels of degenerative disc disease and the chronicity of the cervical complaint. What they found was that uh, there is a statistically significant relationship between neck pain and the number of levels of disc degeneration. Okay? They also identified that it correlated uh, to their neck disability index. So they're in the, what's called a multivariant model, they identified that there's a three-way interaction in this particular project. Uh, chronicity, degeneration, and gender all played a role. So you see next like this with degenerative changes in the mid and lower cervical spine, and these people uh, do uh, have an increase in the severity and chronicity of their neck pain, right? And what I'm showing is obviously a progressive uh, lateral cervical radiograph that shows extensive degeneration on your reading right. Okay, so it, it's pretty clear in the literature. We could go on and on. This paper is 1983, Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery by Norris and Watt. And what they identified here in this initial project and at six month minimum follow up, they showed that no matter how slight the initial degenerative changes in the neck, the spine arthritis and disc disease, that was a contributor, contributor to future pain and future disability after uh, motor vehicle accident collisions. So what we see is it's pretty clear in the literature that spine arthritis and disc disease creates a problem. Okay? The problem may be neck pain, it may be disability. However, as I said earlier, it may be more pronounced th th than that. Due to the effects on the spinal cord, as this degeneration, spine arthritis and disc disease gets worse, the tendency is that it's starting to put more and more pressure, what we call a shear load acting on your spinal cord. So spinal cord runs up and down, disc herniation or bone spur, the bigger it gets, it starts to put pressure directly on that spinal cord. That's not compression, that's called shear. Now shear is also called a transverse load. Transverse loads are very complex, they create a lot of dysfunction in the spinal cord, creating complex neurological symptoms, such as cervical spondylotic myelopathy in some people. It can also cause arm pain, weakness and numbness if it affects your nerve root that, or your motor area that's going down or the sensory area of that nerve root. So it just depends. Is it affecting the nerve root, peripheral nervous system, or is it affecting the central nervous system, right? Okay, now classically cervical spondylotic myelopathy is a spinal cord impingement, but you can also get uh, nerve root involvement as well. So this is just a, a picture from a colleague's text, textbook. Uh, this comes from uh, the 1997 book uh, by Dr. Bill Ruck, who uh, was a teacher at Life Chiropractic College West. He was one of my professors. He practices in the uh, Oakland or Alameda area in California, Dr. Bill Ruck, from his 1997 book. If you look at this, this is a cross section through the sagittal plane of the head and neck. So basically what they've done is they've removed the left side of the face and the neck and you're looking inside at the tissues of the spine. Here's the top of the spine called C1. This is my C2 vertebral body. There's my disc. There's my C3 vertebral body. There's my disc. There's C4 body, C4, C5 disc, C5 body, and then whoops, look at that. The C5, C6 disc the C5 vertebral body, the C6 vertebral body, you're starting to see some funny growths there. Now that's called osteophyte or osteophytic activity. We call that spine arthritis and disc disease. Now look what's happening. This is the spinal cord here running longitudinally through the spinal canal. That disc and those bone spurs posteriorly are putting a shear load on the spinal cord. Okay, now you may or may not have pain but you will have something. When you put pressure on the spinal cord, something is going to happen, okay? Pain is one of those things, okay? So we gotta put this in perspective. The question is really, do you want pressure on your spinal cord? And the answer should be no, because you don't understand what the consequences would be. Over time, that can cause some serious health conditions and some disease conditions. This is not a normal variant, okay? So the reality, in some studies that may find contradictory results to what I've just gone through, 
If there's no correlation to pain, who cares? The larger these osteophytes get and these disc herniations get, it will start to cause serious problems. Just wait. Wait long enough and see what happens, right? It's like the campfire. Oh, the campfire is nice and warm, right? No big deal. You know, it's not burning down the forest. Well, let it go for a while. Walk away. Let the wind come up. See what's going to happen. What's going to happen? The whole damn forest is going to burn down. This is the same kind of concept. Okay, so that leads us to the question of uh, what causes spinal arthritis and disc disease? I know that was kind of a long introduction, but I want to set the stage. What causes spinal arthritis and disc disease, right? Is it age? Well, there is a correlation between the amount and severity of, of spinal arthritis and disc disease and age, obviously. However, is it just age? No. I mean, you, you look at x-rays, we already talked about it one joint or two joints are damaged, yet the other ones aren't. So if it was just age, they would all be damaged, right? Right? Or, you know, I love this one. I have osteoarthritis of my right hip. Well, it just affected your right hip. It skipped your left hip. Why is that? Right? Have you ever asked that? Why? That's interesting. Things that make you go, hmm, hmm, right? So we look at this, we go, is it genetics? Well, you know, genetics is the same thing. Is there a genetic link? Sh certainly there is. There is a, a gene profile that does lead to certain types of spine arthritis and disc disease and certain types of inflammatory arthritides. We know that. However, that's not the whole story either because why does it affect one joint and not the other? Why is it in one hand and not the other? Why is it in one area of your neck and not the rest, right? So it can't just be genes. Is it diet? Diet plays a role too. You are what you eat. If you eat crap, your body will break down due to an alteration of vasculature and oxygenation to the tissues and alteration of proper nutrients. So we know that plays a role too. We know exercise plays a role. We know trauma plays a role. But that's not the whole story. The thing that we're investigating in this project is what about alignment? What about alignment of your spine? What does that do to trigger, stimulate, or progress spinal arthritis and disc disease? Well, it's actually a known law. It's a known law that hard tissues behave to what's called stress. Now, stress is force per unit area. The more force you put on a hard tissue like a bone and even soft tissue like discs and ligaments, the, the greater the density will become. The tissue responds to external load and stimuli. Okay, if it's healthy load, it will increase the density of that tissue. It makes it stronger. If it's unhealthy load or, or what we call asymmetrical load or eccentric loading, you'll get a non-uniform distribution of the effects of that load and it may not be healthy. It may trigger osteophytes and degenerative changes, spine arthritis and disc disease. The law is called Wolf's, Wolf's Law, Stress Generated Potential. Okay, now it's a law. You don't get to believe in it or not. You don't get to go, I don't believe in Wolf's Law. It doesn't work that way. It's kind of like gravity, right? I don't believe in gravity. We'll jump off the building and see what happens, right? Gravity doesn't care if you believe in it or not. It's the same thing as Wolf's Law. So really what we, we want to look at here is let's model the cervical spine and see if we can lend credence and support to the concept that in certain spine configurations, due to alterations in stress, force per unit area, and strain deformation, will we get spine arthritis and disc disease that accelerates and accentuates due to the effects of Wolf's Law, okay? Bone remodels to stress generated potentials. So this is our hypothesis. We hypothesize that increases in stress, force per area, at the anterior vertebral body margins and the posterior body margins, depending on the scenario, will occur in certain kyphotic configurations of the cervical spine compared to a lordotic cervical spine. Now, to our knowledge, nobody had investigated the exactness of this before. What are the stress distributions in the vertebral body 
the front of the body, the back of the body, the outside margin of the body versus the inside vertebral body, what we call cortical or medullary bone. Nobody had investigated this before, okay? So we developed a project to look at this and test what the load, stress and strain, would be on the vertebral body margins in lordotic necks versus kyphotic necks. Will they be different? Can we actually identify why kyphotic necks degenerated, uh, degenerate faster? And will this support Wolf's Law? Okay, so here's what we did. We took four lateral cervicals. We didn't need 500, we only needed four. Okay, we needed a nice healthy lordotic neck that was a uniform smooth curve that had C1, the top of the neck, lined up with the bottom of, of uh, the neck or the top of the thoracic spine. We took an S shape uh, cervical curve with lordosis or curvature in the upper cervical spine and a reverse curve in the lower cervical spine. So their upper half was normal, the lower half was reversed. An S-shaped curve that was opposite of that second one, kyphotic at the top and lordotic at the bottom. And then we took a complete kyphotic configuration, okay? So a complete reversal. Cases were chosen for similar head weights. We chose three females and one males that approximately had the same mass. Okay, so they averaged 88.5 kilograms. They averaged 161.9 centimeters in height. Here's what they look like with a graphical form. Here's the lordotic neck. Here's the reversal down low. Here's the complete reversal. And then here's the reversal up top. Now, just a little background on what we did. The atlas can be considered a fulcrum or balance point from the weight of the head acting on the cervical spine. So the entire weight of the head acts at one point. It acts at the atlas lateral masses, okay? So when we look at the sagittal plane, we can look at the center of mass of the skull acting at the atlas, okay? The weight of the skull is counterbalanced by the force of the posterior extensor muscles. Then there's a lever arm, what's called MA, a moment arm from the atlas lateral mass, MA, distance to the external occipital protruderance where the average force vector of the posterior muscles act. Okay, now we're looking at average force vectors. Yes, there's all kinds of intricate muscles in there, but you know what? There's a reason that bump is on the back lower part of your skull. It's called the external occipital protruderance. Why is that bump there? Why does everybody have one? Well, that's where your average muscle load of the neck in the back pulls on the skull periosteum, and over time, you get a, a, a protruderance there. What it is, is your bone is, is remodeling, it's growing larger to accommodate the stress that the muscles are putting on it. It's a living proof of Wolf's Law. Just feel the back of your head, you'll feel that bump there. That's where your, the, the average force of your posterior muscles act, okay? So we got the weight of the skull, but that really acts at the atlas lateral mass. So we have a lever arm from the center of gravity of the skull, which is about the cella turcica to the atlas lateral mass, and then we have another moment arm that goes back here to the posterior aspect of the skull, external occipital protruderance. Okay, so here's the deal. When C1 is not aligned with T1, that means C1 is not vertically aligned with T1. So the centroids, the geometric center of C1 does not line up with T1. There will be what's called an eccentric load, okay? Eccentric load means, hey, it's not centric, it's not centered, okay? It's displaced one way. The lever arm from this displacement can be computed from each vertebral body centroid to a vertical line through C1. So what we've done is we've put the centroid of each vertebral body here as a dot. We have a vertical line that goes through C1 and T1. Okay, now in this case, they line up, all right? This case, they line up. So I can look at these lever arms, these distances from each geometric center. I can calculate then what's called segmental, segmental lever arms. Now, in the cases of a, uh, different types of kyphotic necks, you'll see how the lever arms change. For example, let's look at the lordosis up top and the uh, kyphotic down at the bottom. C1, I drop my vertical line through the centroid of C1, or the atlas lateral mass, I see that, hey, the lever arms line up at two and three, 
but now I have quite a distance starting to happen at C4, lever arm C5, lever arm C7, then of course lever arm uh, T1. So we're going to use this to build a model. And I'll tell you what we did, okay? Now, I just give you a little bit of background. Now the reality of it is loading scenarios in your spine are quite complex. We know today that the system uh, kind of follows what's called a follower load in mechanics of materials. A follower load is very interesting. What, what it means is along your curve, the load always acts perpendicular to the plane, cross-sectional plane of the disc or vertebral body. So it depends on where you are in the curve column, your muscles will actually act as what, or create what's called a follower load system. So the vertical load is always perpendicular to the cross-sectional area, which is very important because that means, hey, I, I have stability, I can support the load. However, it's also appropriate in vector mechanics to take these perpendicular load situations shown, look here, the, the arrows show what I was trying to describe. Just look at the picture deed, right? The arrows show that, hey, we're always perpendicular to the cross-sectional area uh, or average cross-sectional area of the plane of the vertebral body. Or you could say it's parallel to the posterior vertebral bodies, if you will. And so you look at these arrows, they're changing directions as we move from top to the bottom. Well, that's what's called a follower load. However, it's also reasonable in vector mechanics to add these things tip to tail, looking at their magnitude and direction, and then get what's called an average vector. So the average load. Well, guess what the average load is when you add all these vectors tip to tail? The average load is vertical. It goes straight down. It's a compression load, right? So, you know, it's... Either way you look at it, it's, it's valid to explain it this way. I meet a lot of people that go, oh, well, the average load isn't, isn't, per, or isn't parallel with gravity. It's a follower load. And I'm like, have you ever had vector mechanics? You ever did you know, tip to tail, magnitude and direction, right? Did you ever make your parallelogram? Because I did. Some of you know what I mean when I say that, but back to this, right? So the average load goes straight down here. So the average load is actually behind the vertebral body. Well, guess what's there? When you have a lordosis, the average load, the average vector that goes down is here. What's back there to support that? Because you go, well, that's not the vertebral body. You go, well, the good news is God, Mother Nature, Buddha, somebody that do, knew what they were doing put these things called articular pillars back there. Articular pillars are the posterior elements. They're called pillars because they're load-bearing. I'll show you a cross-sectional picture coming up. They are load-bearing, okay? Now, they support that load, okay? When the average load is vertical, straight down, and it's slightly behind the vertebral body, something's got to be back there to support the load. And we have articular pillars. They're named anatomically a pillar because somebody knew that they supported load. Okay, now this is the way the system is set up. Okay, so just look at the picture. If I have a circle, what I can do is I can calculate where the projected center of gravity or the center of mass of that whole column acts. So we can use a, an equation that'll, I'll just pop to the equation so you see it. We can use a, an equation that says the average center of mass of a circular column of uniform density, which the cervical spine is close to uniform density. Not exactly, but it's close to uniform density, enough that we can apply this. And we know the curve is a circular curve. If I use this equation here, the center of mass equals the radius of the curve times sine of the angle, alpha, which is half of a bisector, okay? So I take alpha here, half of my bisector, and I divide that by alpha, so I get radius times sine alpha divided by alpha, alpha. I can look at where the average center of mass acts in a circular column in a cross-sectional plane. Now, what does this mean for us? Well, when you have a cervical lordosis, Okay, now this dashed line is a straight up and down column. That would be no curve. Well, we know we're supposed to have a cervical lordosis. So I look at A4, A4, I'm sorry I turned it around so it matched the picture direction here. 
A4, okay, what we call a mild curve. A4 is associated with C4, circular center of mass projection in the sagittal plane. You'll notice that that projection of center of mass is posterior to the curved column. Okay, just like our example here, the average vector going straight down is behind the vertebral bodies. Okay, so A4, the curve A4, the projected center of gravity is right there. A3, a little bit deeper curve, the projected center of gravity is right here, moving further backwards behind the vertebral body. A2, the projected center of gravity is right there. A1 is C1, the center of gravity or center of mass of the column right there. You'll notice the deeper the curve, the further the center of mass acts behind the actual curvature itself, the curved column, okay? It's not the, it's not the radius, okay? It's not the, we're not looking at the, the radius of curve. The radius of curve would be much further posterior, or the radius of, of the center of the circular curve, okay? This is the projected center of mass where it acts. So what you have to realize in this example that I'm showing you, the concept is, when you have a cervical curvature, the average center of mass acts behind the vertebral body. And it's a good thing there's articular pillars there. The articular pillars support that load with the vertebral body. Okay, so these concepts, we're gonna build on them. Now, here's the cross-sectional view of a vertebra. So here's the vertebral body. That point right there is the geometric center of the vertebral body. Here's my articular pillars. Okay, these are the things that are supporting a lot of the load when you have a cervical curve. How much load? Well, in spine, I believe it was 1988 or 1986 by PAL, P-A-L, and Shirk. S-C-H-E-R-K, you can look it up. Just go to pubmed.com, Powell and Shirk. They looked at this and they said, you know what? In the cervical spine, when you have a lordosis, two thirds of the compression load of the head and cervical spine and muscle load is borne by the articular pillars. The articular pillars are these two things back here, okay? Now, they're smaller than the vertebral body, yet they take the majority of the load. These guys here, that's this structure right back here. You see the top of it here. That's what's called the facet joint. Well, that's the top of that right there. This structure here, the pillar, is this segment here. There's two of them, one on each side. Now, you can't see both of them. They overlap on a lateral view. They superimpose. The vertebral body here is the front of the vertebra. And I'm showing this not for the doctors, but for the patients that might be listening to this out there. Because this gets a little bit technical, so a picture puts it in perspective. So in a cervical curvature, you have two-thirds of the load acting on your articular pillars, your facet joints. Okay, one-third of the load is borne by the vertebral body. You can look that up, Powell and Shirk, spine 1986 or 88. Now in a kyphotic neck, this is the problem, a reversed neck curve. What happened to the average center of mass of the circular column? Where did it go? It should be in the back, it should be posterior. It should be back in here. Where did it go? When you reverse your neck curve, where did the average mass go? Where does the average mass go? It goes in front of the vertebral body, it goes out here. It goes out in the front. There's no articular pillars there. It's in the front of the vertebral body. There's nothing there. What's there? Your trachea. Your trachea does not like compression load. Do you guys follow this? Now, this is the simple explanation of what's going on, okay? What we see here is that the center of mass is now acting at a point outside the column where there's no bone. So your body takes that mass and it goes, whoa, there's load out here and I don't know what to do with it. It should be on the back of my vertebral body and the facet joints, the articular pillars, but it's not, it's out here. So what does your body do? Well, it builds bone. Over time, the disc gets squished and the vertebral bone starts to grow to support that load. That's what spinal arthritis osteophytes are. They're your body's way of building bone to accommodate the new load that's acting on it. It's pouring cement. It's trying to increase the foundation due to the stress on it. 
Now, it's not good, but it has to do it, right? Until you change the load, it's going to keep pouring cement because it's got to do something because that load is huge and it's way out here. Now, that's the simplicity of it. Getting a little excited here. My dad would be proud of me. In fact, if he were here, he'd be yelling at you even worse than I am. So don't think I'm angry if you're just watching this. I just get excited and it's a little bit of passion here. Now, the reality of it is way more complicated than what I just shared with you. We had to build a model that accounted for the true cross-sectional area of the vertebral body and the discs and the articular pillars. We had to model what's called the cortical bone, which is the outside margin of the bone. It's the, the uh, dense, compact bone, very thin around the outside of the vertebral body. And then we had to model the medullary bone, which is the spongy bone inside the cortex. Okay, so this is shown here, an elliptical cross-sectional area. T is the thickness of the cortex of the vertebral body. And then the rest of this would be considered spongy bone inside of that. Uh, we created what's called an elliptical cross-sectional model. We had to do that to build this. And we looked at anatomically, what's the area of the vertebral body surface versus the area of the articular uh, pillar surfaces. We had to build that into the model. We had to separate out cortical load and medullary load. And then we had to separate load out in the front of the vertebral body versus the, the uh, posterior vertebral body. Okay, so this is just showing you what we did. We took this area here, we built an elliptical cross-sectional model, and then we split that elliptical cross-section into cortical bone and medullary bone. This is one part of our model. Now, don't get hung up on the equations here. Quite frankly, to be honest with you, you know, I quit early in my mechanical engineering. I don't have a bachelor's degree. I had to work with people that had PhDs and master's degree in mechanical engineering to do these equations. I understand the concept, so I'm just gonna explain the concept. We built five equations, and we did what's called short compression block equations. So we looked at the vertebral bodies in the cervical spine, that functional unit as a short compression block. And these are validated equations in engineering uh, of structural design. And we showed that the cervical spine fits those cri or that criteria. So we built what's called short compression block equations. Now, nine variables, nine variables. Remember in, in math when you had to account for two variables and you were like freaking out, right? Well, we have to account for nine variables here. Fun stuff, right? The bending moment is M. So when you see the symbol M, that's the bending moment. Lever arm, I've already shown you some example of lever arm. L is the lever arm. Radius of curve is just simply the R. Head weight is uh, W, right? And remember, weight is mass times acceleration. So on this earth, you know, weight is mass times acceleration, right? So the weight of the head. And just really quickly, the weight of the head, we used estimates from the Air Force from uh, the 1960s and 70s from Clauser et al. We looked at uh, information that showed us what the mass of the head would be. It's 7.55% body mass. So we can take the, the kilograms of the person and we can multiply that by 7.55% and we get the weight of their head, right? And then we have the posterior uh, muscle force. FV. We can calculate that. Number one, there's studies in the literature that show us what the average lever arm is from the EOP to the cervical spine. We also calculated it on our x-ray. The other thing is there's studies in the literature that show how much force they, they contract with. And then we, we built in the model, it's just a simple static equilibrium model where the, the posterior muscle force has to counterbalance the weight of the head and the anterior musculature relative to the center of, of uh, gravity acting at the atlas. So the cella turcica to the atlas, that's a distance, and then atlas to the posterior muscle force. So we had to have those two be equal because it's a static equilibrium model. And then uh, the elliptical area, my elliptical cross-sectional area A, we've talked about that, we broke it down into cortex and medullary bone. And then what's called the moment of inertia, I, stress concentrations acting at a given point, K, and then the modulus of elasticity, E. Okay, so we had to build these variables into our equations, look them up in the literature where we didn't have them from our subjects, and when we had them from our subjects, we applied that data. 
Okay, so here's the five different equations building on it, and you can see uh, the fifth equation looks really, really fun, and we'll just skip that because uh, actually a computer program was built to solve that anyway. Study results. <clears throat> now, due to what I've just gone through with you, we expect due to the center of gravity shifting forward when I lose my curve and due to the lever arm distance changes from the average load acting relative to the vertebral body, we, we, we hypothesized we should see an increase in the load. We didn't know how much. We didn't know how much our equations would predict. And we didn't even quite frankly know if they would, right? So the reality of it is we're testing this idea. Okay, so here's what we found. The combined stresses, that's force per area, at the anterior vertebral body margins, that's the front of the vertebra, in the lordotic neck, so in the lordotic neck, they were quite uniform between 1.7 and 4.4 megapascals. Plus indicates they're in a mild tension, I'll explain that to you. That's interesting. The lordotic neck had a very uniform tension at the front of the vertebral body. We'll talk about that when we get there. Okay, or actually, let me just go back here. Why does this make sense? Let me show you a picture. Well, if I have a curved column, the convex surface, the front should be under tension. If you take a structure and you bend it backwards, you should have a mild tension on the front of that surface. Conversely, we should have a mild compression on the back part of that surface due to the, the uh, concavity back there. And of interest, that's what this is saying. That's what we found. And I'm just showing you the anterior load scenario. The opposite was true in the posterior scenario. We had a mild, uniform compression on the posterior vertebral body, but this is the anterior. However, combined stresses at the anterior vertebral margins in the kyphotic configuration, so where they change directions, instead of having a nice backwards bend, your vertebra bend the wrong way. These stresses change directions. Look at the sign. Plus means tension, negative means compression. So they switched directions, and then look, they went from 1.7 to 16.1 megapascals to a maximum of minus 35.5 megapascals in compression. What is this? It's roughly 10 times higher in magnitude in their absolute value. 10 times higher! We're blown away by that. 10 times higher. When you change your neck curve, from natural curvature lordosis to kyphotic, your loads, the compression versus the tension, number one, they change directions. Instead of a mild tension on the front, you get a mild, or you get a huge compression. It's 10 times greater. Whoa. Okay, could that trigger osteophytes to grow? Could that trigger bone spurs, spine arthritis, and disc disease? Okay, anterior stresses in the S shape, look at this reached a maximum of minus 21.9 megapascals in compression instead of tension at the kyphotic areas. These values are approximately three to 13 times the tension magnitude in absolute value compared to the lordotic neck. So here's what we gotta look at. Let's look at a graph, right? We'll explain it a little nicer. This is distribution of the anterior stresses in the cortex. So let me jump forward to a picture so you see what I'm looking at. Here's the front of the vertebral body right there, if you see my arrow. Just making sure it shows up on the screen. This is the front of the vertebral body. That's the anterior, the cortex. So we're looking at this, the anterior cortical stresses in this graph. If I look at a lordotic neck, the lordotic neck is here, lordosis. That's my nice curve. Two is the segment of the vertebra we're looking at. C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, and C7. Zero means there's no load, no compression, no tension. Plus means a mild tension on the front. Look at C2, mild tension. C3, mild tension. C4, mild tension. C5, mild tension. Six, mild tension. Seven, mild tension. Now certainly the tensile load is greater at four, five, and six than the other segments. Why? Well, let's go to a, back to the picture. Why is it greater? Well, when I look at this, I go to this picture here. 
the lever arm from the average vector, the average force of gravity and muscles acting down, the lever arm is greatest at four, five, and six. The lever arms are small, smaller at C2, C3, and then C7 and T1. So the distance is greater at four, five, and six, so we should see a bigger tensile load there. Okay, so just to put this in perspective, why we found what we found. Now, the reality of it though, this is very, very uniform. When you have a deep curve, and we chose a 40 degree neck curve to study here. Let me give you a quote from the PhD in mechanical engineering, Professor Bill Jones. Quote, I will never forget this. When we were first doing this project and we had the results, he e emailed my father and I and the other colleagues on the paper, and he said, whoa, look how uniform the anterior cortical tensile stresses are. They're very uniform. I did not expect that for such a deep cervical curve. God, Mother Nature, Buddha must have known some, some engineering when they built this thing. That's what the professor at uh, Mississippi State, State, State said about this right here. So you, you gotta be blown away about this. You gotta go, whoa, this is interesting. This system is set up to have near uniform stresses when you have a cervical lordosis. Just look at that. Now look at the S curves in the kyphotic neck. I'll start with the S curve here. This is the S curve where it's lordotic at the top but kyphotic at the bottom, okay? So kyphotic at the bottom. What do you notice? Number one, the stresses change direction. They go above my neutral axis. They change from tension to compression and they're very high in the lower segments. Why? Well, that's where the lever arm is the greatest. That's where the bending moment's the greatest. That's where the compression load is the greatest. Okay, now look at the kyphotic neck. The kyphotic neck, the complete reverse neck curve, it has bad loading from top to bottom. And right in the middle of the cervical spine, C4, C5, and C5, C6, that's where the compression loads are the highest. So stop, doctors. Why do C4 through C6 degenerate more than the rest of the verte vertebral levels? Why? Well, it's the load that's acting on them. Why in that neck that we showed in the beginning did they degenerate at five and six but yet they weren't degenerated at the other levels. Why? Well, it has to do with this. It's the mechanical stress acting on it. The compression stress is very high there. It's triggering a response out of the, your body's physiology. Your body's via Wolf's Law. When you have compression load, your body, what happens is osteoblasts. their cells in the bone. They respond to compression load. They're triggered to react. There's a charge distribution that changes and osteoblasts go, wow, I gotta build bone. Blast builds. You think about a blast as tearing down, no, blast builds. So an osteoblast builds bone at these levels that have high compressive stresses in the cortical margin, okay? So you just look at this graph and you go, holy cow. This explains why we see what we see. This is the, the, the proof of Wolf's Law on a kyphotic neck. Here's the distribution of stresses in the posterior cortex. So these should be a mirror image, a reversal of what we see in the anterior cortex. And sure enough, look at this. The posterior vertebral body cortical margin is under a uniform compression load when I have alertosis. So it's a uniform compression because it's the concavity part of the curve, not the convexity. And then when you look at the kyphotic S curves, compared to the complete kyphosis. You start to see what's happening. You have huge differences in the magnitude and then a complete difference in the direction of the average stress vectors that are occurring here. Crazy. All right, so that's our results. The next question is, does that fit reality? Is this what we truly see? We, we seem to see it on an x-ray, but what about other research? Because this is a model. We say the model predicted the following. Well, let's look at research that exists in the literature. For example, let's look at the surgical outcome literature. Let's look at subjects before and after fusion and let's follow them for a period of years and let's see who degenerates more at long-term follow-up at, at surgery and let's see why. So the Faldini paper, 
This came out in clinical orthopedics and related research in 2011. This is a 10-year follow-up of 107 patients that had disc herniation and degenerative joint disease at one level. It was affecting their spinal cord and nerve root. They had to have a surgical procedure called the disc discectomy and a fusion. So they fused them, they removed the offending you know, disc so it didn't put pressure on the nerve, and now they're gonna follow them at long-term follow-up and try to find out why certain people get what's called adjacent segment degenerative disease. That's like spinal arthritis and disc disease. That means above or below the fusion, why do some people start to break down faster than other people, even though we didn't fuse that area? Here's the thing, chiropractors, we think this, well, you immobilized the fused joint, so then the other joints above and below that have to move more, right? That's what we're trained. I'm here to tell you that's only one part of the explanation. Watch what this paper found, 10-year follow-up. What they identified is that for each degree of positive sagittal segmental angle, there is a 20% reduced risk of adjacent level disc disease. What is a positive sag sagittal segmental angle? Well, that means a lordotic neck. Okay, here's what they identified. For each degree of lordosis at the fusion, there's a 20% reduction in the rate of a developing adjacent segment disc disease. So, <clears throat> in patients without adjacent segment disc disease, they averaged about five degrees of lordosis at the fusion. At the fused level, that single level, five degrees of curve, okay? at that one level. Here's the subjects that developed adjacent segmental disease. They averaged almost two degrees of kyphosis, okay? So it's not just mobility, it's alignment. This study is a great project, look what they showed. Kyphotic post-operative segmental alignment was related to adjacent level degeneration, okay? When you had Adjacent segmental disc disease at 10 year follow up after surgery, it was driven by a fused segment in kyphosis instead of the surgeon getting you to lordosis. That's exactly what we found in our model. Our model would predict that. Our model predicts why that would occur. So then we built a, an animation or a simulation of this. So here's the lordotic neck that was actually used in the project. You lose your curve over time, the stresses and strains change. They go from uniform tension at the front or near uniform to high compression on the front. Six to 13 times greater. And over time, that load triggers your body's natural innate reaction. Your cells respond to the load placed on them and your spine starts to deteriorate and break down. It's called spine arthritis and disc disease. It's a law. Our paper just modeled it. We were one of the first authors to model this loading scenario discussing why we see certain configurations in the spine not associated with disc degeneration and bone spurs, and why others, like a reverse neck curve, are highly associated with degenerative disc disease, right? If you're a patient out there, let me be frank with you. You should be concerned about this. You should be concerned about this. You may not, might not have pain now, or maybe you have a little bit of pain, but the reality of it is, do you want this to progress? Do you want it to get worse? My answer would be no. I want to do things that are in my best interest to protect my spine and body from breaking down over time. I can't control my genetics. I can't. I, I got what I got, right? I'm five foot seven with shoes. I like to think I'm six two. I can't control that. I can't control that. What can I control? I can control my diet. I can control my exercise. I can control my alignment. I can go get a lateral cervical x-ray from a CBP trained chiropractor and I can find out, do I have a proper cervical curve? 
How much, if any, spine arthritis and disc disease do I have? What can I do to prevent it from getting worse? Well, I can change my diet, I can exercise properly, and you better work on your spine alignment. Spine alignment is a big driver for how fast your body tissues will wear down. It's a law. We presented a model that calculated that, and the predicted results fit in with actual studies in the literature and fit in with known physiology, okay? Hopefully you enjoyed this presentation. This one was a little bit long and a little more technical. It was, again, was in honor of my late father, uh, Professor Dr. Don Harrison. Uh, really loved the man. He uh, gave a lot of insight and value uh, to patient care, chiropractic, and he changed really a lot of lives and perspective in, in, perspectives in chiropractic. Uh, any chiropractor that knows my late father uh, knows that that's really an understatement. Uh, so hopefully you enjoyed this week's presentation. And you know what, if you're a patient out there, let's find a CBP trained chiropractor. Let's not wait until you're older and you get more complex neurological conditions from your spine degeneration. Let's try to do things that will slow down the wear and tear on our spine. And those things I've already discussed and presented. If you're a doctor out there, hopefully you're enjoying these educational videos. Let's, let's look to do some CBP care. Let's you know, attend conferences, let's read some, some of the work, let's learn how to properly manage some of these uh, patient conditions we talk about. Let's do proper spine corrective care. Love to have you on board with CBP Technique. Also would love to have you support CBP nonprofit research. You can look at the link on the screen for how to do that. Till next time, I'm Dr. Deed Harrison. Thank you for your time and attention.